Galaxy 666 by Hell Toro. Session 37. Welcome back, fellow Voyagers, to Galaxy 666. Your guide, Tug, here. Pell has honed his skill of saying nothing with many words to a fine edge, and he cuts us in several new ways here. Let's more closely examine our alien visitors and list what we do know. They are slightly larger than an adult human male. They have pseudopods, like the foot of a snail instead of arms. They move slowly, and they have things stuck on their heads. Given Pell's history of complete non-description, this short list seems massive. Of course, it is nothing compared to the full paragraph he consumes, providing us with terms that are synonymous to odd, which he concludes with one of the great writing cop-outs, they still remained indescribable in any concrete terms. What terms is he even trying to use to describe them? The difficulty is Pell is trying to provide an individual summary description from the point of view of our protagonists, as if an interviewer had asked each of them to sum up, in one word, the aliens. That is when such words as freakish and grotesque come upon us and make sense. However, Pell is writing as the narrator at this point, not a character, and is doing us, the reader, a great disservice. Newspaper reporters and other journalists are supposed to be personally detached from what they are reporting. Quality news reporting provides details that a reader would experience if they were at the scene of the news, not the reporter's opinion of the news, which is commentary. In the case of a bombing, they may describe the noise, the smoke rising, the acrid aroma, the vacant looks of the victims, the blood, none of which are comments that hold judgment. They are insightful details that one may not even be aware of if they had been present at the scene. Picture yourself experiencing a pleasant spring morning. You may only think, it is a pleasant morning, and not be consciously aware of the hum of the bees, the chirp of the titmouse, the smell of the honeysuckle and lilac or the feel of the warmth of the rising sun on your face. But as all those details that tell your brain, it is a pleasant morning. A writer will provide you a select palette of detail from which they hope you will comprehend the picture they have in mind. What Pell is doing here is simply giving you the picture. They were odd. If Pell was describing the spring morning, he would say, it is pleasant, and then to fill space provide a list of words meaning pleasant, some common, some archaic, but non-descriptive. Pell uses a similar tool shortly after. This time we are to understand that the aliens can communicate telepathically while in physical contact. This process is far more rapid than speech, so much information is passed between Ishklaw and one of the aliens. Pell now has the problem of how to express to us, the reader, what is being communicated. As a writer, he has several tools in his tool bag to accomplish this. He could have us now experience the thoughts. As the aliens describe the world, we see it. As it describes its history, we live it. At the end of which, Ishklaw would recover and be shocked at how little time has passed. Pell could also have Ishklaw relate the information to someone else. Having a companion has been a staple for writers for centuries to allow a main character to relate their inner thoughts to the audience. What do you think, Watson? And then we hear the mind of Sherlock Holmes. What is that creature, Doctor? And then Doctor Who gives us needed backstory on the alien. Pell is apparently setting us up to do just that with Oski as he says, What did they say? But Pell has Ishklaw respond with, It would take far too long. I don't feel much like giving a lengthy interpretation at the moment. Really? Of course. Who has time to create the interesting backstory to help us understand what is happening? Why the aliens are here? Their intent? Certainly not Pell. Clearly he too doesn't feel much like giving a lengthy interpretation at this moment. Surprise, surprise. It is also hard not to note how nonchalant and emotionless our characters are. Here they stand, marooned on an alien world, watching an alien ship land, have aliens very slowly sluice right up to them and wrap their tentacles around them, and they don't budge an inch. They don't just not run away. They don't move away. They don't move. In the hands of a masterful writer, that would mean something. Defiance, fear, petrification. But in the hands of Pell, it means something quite different. Myopia. As Pell is watching the story unfold in his head, he is focusing on one thing at a time. Imagine watching a movie through a pinhole, able to see only one small area at the moment and not aware what other characters in the scene are doing. 
things should be happening with our group. If they are scared, they should move away. If curious, move toward. If unconcerned, stay put. They stay put. So they are unconcerned about the arrival of an alien in a spaceship to a planet upon which they are marooned? That's nonsense. But if they are unconcerned, we the readers will be as well. Are we meant to be unconcerned at this central plot moment? No. Once again, Pell is a victim of his own system. He has not had the time to plot the story out and has only a vague idea of where it is going. As such, he is simply rambling into his tape recorder and has never asked himself the questions of, what would Ishklaw and the other team members be doing at this moment? What would they be thinking? Not having the plot laid out in advance makes it difficult to examine other viewpoints and what details will be important. All of Session 36's flaws are endemic to the Pulp Fiction short fuse writing methods. They provide us with ample opportunity to shake our heads, instruction on what not to do, and delight at the moronic antics of our hapless heroes. Rest assured, more such opportunities await us in. Galaxy 666. Here ends Session 37.